go. Happy Friday, top of the hour on NBC News Now, and we are kicking it off with a fiery President Biden, now taking his vision for the state of our union on the road. He'll be speaking any minute now in a key battleground state. We are live at the White House with what his supporters are saying about his performance last night and his chances going forward. Also, the backlash against TikTok. Congress gearing up for a vote to ban this popular app unless it cuts ties with this Chinese parent company, how users are fighting back. Then many young Americans worried about finding work, maybe finding a solution, guess what, in government jobs. We'll explain. Plus the Pentagon, did you see this out today saying if there's any life out there, we still haven't found it. It is throwing water on all of those UFO reports. Yeah, I know you're thinking, what about E.T.? And why this year's big winners at the box office might also win big at the Oscars. It's a huge shift. We'll break it all down later in the show. Good day. I'm Tom Costello. I'm in for Halley. Any minute now, we will see President Biden taking his show on the road, hitting the campaign trail less than 24 hours after a speech that may have, may have saved his political life. Right now, we're looking live at the shot we have up in Philadelphia. We expect the president to speak any moment, likely following the same themes from his fiery State of the Union address where he laid out his plan of attack against former President Donald Trump. And he made the case that 81, his age, is not the number people should be thinking about, but rather four, as in four more years he wants in the White House. This trip kicks off a week of campaigning for both the president and the vice president, going to all of the states he'll need to win in November. And here they are, Georgia, of course, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, and all important Michigan. What will the message look like? We're told to expect the same themes, spinning his age as experience you only get with age. Going after Mr. Trump, of course, and Republicans for the January 6th insurrection. And what he says is inaction in Congress, sharpening his message on reproductive rights and talking up what he says is America's economic comeback. He will likely be riding the wave of those strong jobs numbers out today. They beat expectations. We're going to talk more about those numbers. Look at that. Pretty good. We're going to talk about the, more of that later on the show. And you see the poll here. Americans who watch the speech are reacting mostly positively. Nearly two-thirds of them, back out of the way, nearly two-thirds of them had a positive reaction. All right, NBC's Kelly O'Donnell, as you know, covers the White House. Uh, Kelly, historically, people who watch the State of the Union already support the president, but his supporters are saying they really needed to see a strong performance from him last night. And are they happy? Well, some of the uh, sort of outreach we've done today is giving us that kind of feedback, Tom. And when you consider the enormity of the night for the president, followed up by today, what you have previewed, a campaign-style event. And right now, the president and first lady are doing what I would call sort of a micro-campaign stop. They are visiting with a particular family in the Pennsylvania area, hearing their story. So that's that one-on-one -on -one interaction after the big night of tens of millions of Americans watching. And today, we checked in with some of those who watched the president, what their expectations were, and how did he do. Here's what we got from a sample of voters. I was so happy I jumped out of my seat at the end. He was awesome. He was powerful. He got his point across. He stood strong. He looked like a president. And uh, that's what we needed. Those sorts of assessments are important. Our colleague Monica Alba was out there on the ground in Pennsylvania talking to voters. And part of what the White House and the campaign wanted to answer, Tom, is that question on the minds of many Americans. Would age be a factor? How would they judge his stamina? What did they think of his ideas? Does he seem up for another four years? In all the ways that voters make that assessment. And so those were some snapshots about what people are thinking today. Tom? You know, I heard some folks today, Kelly, saying he needs to bring that level of energy and passion or anger, whatever it was last night. He needs to bring that to the campaign trail and to every single stop. And he's also got his cabinet out on the campaign trail, right? A full court press. 
part of what is sort of a traditional outreach that happens in years that are not campaign years, where members of the cabinet are trying to work on policy. Obviously, everything is in a hyper sort of level of attention because it is a campaign year and uh, an unusual one and one during a time of divided politics. So, yes, members of the cabinet who will be responsible for helping to implement Biden policies that have been enacted, those that are on the plan for the remainder of his current term and if there is another term, they are fanning out not only to battleground states but all different regions of the country. And they're there to talk about issues that fall in their lane. So you have the energy secretary talking about climate issues. You have outreach to uh, special communities and communities that are in the base of the president. Those who are talking about specific infrastructure spending, all those kinds of things to magnify the president's message, not only on the personality issues, but on the ideas, the policies, the specific steps the administration wants to take. The campaign is arguing it can take if they get four more years. Tom? Senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. Thank you, Kelly. Tonight, former President Trump is expected to sit down with the Prime Minister of Hungary, a meeting out of a scene from his days as president, bringing together the two men really most associated with this particular brand of conservatism uh, on their respective continents. The Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, is a longtime ally of former President Trump and a tolerated ally in NATO, the military alliance Mr. Trump bashed throughout his presidency, and now he's doing it again on the campaign trail. Orban is often compared to Mr. Trump, among other reasons, for Orban's anti-immigrant statements and policies. NBC's Von Hilliard is following all of this for us. Von, uh, presidential candidates don't usually get visits at their homes from foreign leaders, and Orban is widely accused of being an authoritarian. Why would Trump be sitting down with him now? Donald Trump, Tom, views Viktor Orban as not only a foreign ally, but also one here domestically. I can tell you from having conversations with voters on the ground, you hear folks talk about Orban because, frankly, Donald Trump brings him up quite often on the campaign trail, suggesting that uh, in many ways, uh, leaders around the country need to emulate the Hungarian leader. If you just look at some of the comparisons between the two, take a look at their comments on immigration, for example. Donald Trump suggesting that uh, immigrants poison the blood of the country. Orban suggesting, quote, we do not want to become a mixed race on Nick. Excuse me, on NATO, Russia can do whatever the hell they want, Donald Trump suggested last month when he pushed these NATO countries to pay up more toward their own national defense. And of course, just here in the last month, uh, uh, the final country to approve Sweden being uh, uh, becoming a member of NATO. And then when you're looking at democracy, of course, Donald Trump repeatedly uh, making his election denial claims and compared to Viktor Orban, who has also been at the forefront, he is now serving a fourth term in office. For Donald Trump, having Viktor Orban come to Florida is very telling. It was in New Hampshire at a campaign rally just back in New, in New Hampshire back in January, Tom, when Donald Trump said from the stage that Viktor Orban was a great leader and a strong leader and making the case that that's why a lot of people don't like him. Donald Trump then went on to say, quote, it's nice to have a strong man running your country. Of course, Democrats have expressed fears that Donald Trump intends to be a strong man and uh, in much in the way that Viktor Orban is overseen in a liberal democracy, uh, having a leader here in the United States that tries to emulate him. Well, he's virtually quashed democracy in Hungary. It's pretty much a one-party state right now. He also controls the media. Uh, by the way, just yesterday, Sweden officially joined NATO after Orban and Hungary finally lifted that block. If Mr. Trump is reelected, there's already talk that he and Orban could undermine NATO, even as the Russia threat is growing more serious. Right. And this is you heard from Joe Biden last night in his State of the Union address, concerns about the state of democracy, but also the role that the U.S. plays uh, overseas. And as part of the NATO alliance, Sweden is now the 36th, uh, 32nd member of NATO. But it was Hungary who was the final member country to hold up approving Sweden to become a part of NATO. And when you look at the EU and international support for uh, Ukraine, aid to Ukraine and their efforts to defend the country from Russia, it was Joe 
just here in the last month, that finally under pressure that Viktor Orban in Hungary was the final EU country to sign off on $50 billion in aid going from the EU to Ukraine. Of course, Donald Trump has been at the forefront of uh, expressing concern or hesitancy from the U.S. continuing to provide aid to Ukraine. So Donald Trump views Orban, if he were to get back into the White House, as a leader on that front. Yeah, Orban is also very close to uh, Vladimir Putin. Vaughn, thank you. Vaughn Hilliard. Uh, next week, the House is set to vote on a bill that could get TikTok banned in the U.S., and that has a lot of users of the app very angry. It's a bipartisan bill aimed to get TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, to sell the app or make it unavailable in the United States. Now, remember, ByteDance is based out of Beijing. The chief concern from lawmakers and critics is protecting U.S. data from the Chinese government. ByteDance says it is a private company not owned or controlled by the Chinese government. The bills got the support of the House Speaker, and it just advanced out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee with a 50 to nothing vote. TikTok is trying to fight back, sending out this notification to users who are 18 and older asking them to call their representatives to tell them to vote no on the bill. That seems to be working. We're hearing from some lawmakers who tell our team their offices have been flooded with phone calls from angry constituents who love TikTok. NBC's Brian Chung joins us now. Brian, talk us through this bill now and the kind of impact it could have, you know, to underscore this. If you're a, a teen, a 20-something, you love TikTok. Yeah, well, and that's the reason why so many of these campaign, or rather some of these congressional offices were getting flooded with calls yesterday. But let's unpack exactly what's being proposed here. So again, this bill passed the uh, House uh, Com Commerce Committee yesterday. And what it proposes to do is to force the uh, holding company, which is a Chinese company known as ByteDance, to sell TikTok within 180 days of the enactment of the bill. It also offers a narrow process for the executive branch to do so as well. But it's really that first prong that would be used uh, in this law to essentially force ByteDance to sell the company. If it doesn't do so within six months, the entire app would be banned nationwide. It is a bipartisan bill, which suggests that and now that it's advanced from the committee, once it does face a four full floor vote, which the House Majority Leader says will come sometime next week, that it could face full passage. Uh, take a listen to what uh, Representative Jeffries on the Democratic side said with regards to momentum on this bill. That is impressive in nature in any instance, but particularly as it relates to something in the social media space, which hasn't always been easy for Democrats and Republicans to find common ground. That was House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. And again, he's talking about that 50 to 0 vote out of the committee. Very unprecedented in this Congress, but it just shows, Tom, they're all appearing on the same side, uh, at least on this front. Yeah, you know, we mentioned the campaign that TikTok is underway, it has underway right now to get users on its side. My gosh, they're running TV commercials showing nuns uh, using TikTok. Uh, what else is TikTok uh, bite dance saying? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a full blitz from the company trying to get people, their users, to call their congressperson to say, vote this down. In a statement, TikTok did say uh, the following. This legislation has a predetermined outcome, a total ban of TikTok in the United States. They say this will destroy the people who are building livelihoods. They're selling uh, things on TikTok. We spoke with one person who said uh, they built a whole uh, livelihood out of selling trinkets that they uh, really promote through their thousands of followers on TikTok. So TikTok is trying to lean into those types of users to drive the political rhetoric to shoot down this type of legislation. But whether or not it's successful, again, it's a bipartisan push here. And we have to acknowledge if it passes the House, once it gets to the Senate, we've also heard that the White House seems to be in uh, support of this because we've heard the National Security Council say uh, they think that this is a good step. So we'll have to see how this develops, Tom. Really is an amazing development. And by the way, some of these TikTokers, they go on to get TV roles, movie roles. They I do. mean, this thing has taken on a life of its own. Yep. Brian, thank you very much. Brian Chung. Uh, to the skies now. And right now, a tornado watch is in effect for parts of the south as they brace for what could be a dangerous evening with severe thunderstorms moving across the region. Six million people now at risk from these intense storms. They stretch all the way from Texas to Georgia. On top of that... 14 million people in the same area are under flood watches. Let's bring in now NBC meteorologist Bill Karens. All right, lots going on here with that yeah. weather map. Lay it out for us and just how serious might these storms be. We are in the springtime, right? So things can get rather violent. 
Yeah, we all know how unusually warm it's been early this March, too. So it's almost like an April weather pattern where we expect to get these violent storms almost each and every afternoon. So this is a two-day event. We're starting now. We're going to take this right through the day tomorrow all the way up the East Coast. So here's our tornado watch, this pink box that includes Mobile and Biloxi, Baton Rouge, Hattiesburg, into sections here of Alabama. This goes until 9 o'clock this evening. Notice this one little red box here. We haven't had many tornado warnings, but this is a new one that we've just seen. This also is a flash flood warning, in effect, just south of Jackson. Mississippi. We've had about one to two inches of rainfall in this area. Here's that tornado warning. So this is Interstate 59 coming outside of Hattiesburg, heading south. This is including the town of Purvis. This is just a radar indicator. So in other words, the Doppler radar is showing that the storm is spinning in the atmosphere. It can produce a tornado at any time. And there's a lot of rain with this. So the storm chasers probably won't even have a good visual, even if it does have a tornado. So this is where the tornado sirens are going off. And we'll keep you posted if we hear any updates on that storm. This is that map we just showed you. The area is at risk as we go throughout the rest of today. This area in red, if we get any tornadoes, this is where they would likely happen. So we just showed you where that one tornado warning was. Later this evening, we'll spread this into areas of Georgia. So through Saturday evening, we have a chance for some very heavy rain. I already showed you all of the areas in Mississippi here that have just gotten drenched. Tonight, all that rain moves through Alabama and Georgia from Atlanta to Albany, especially around Columbus. Someone's going to pick up two to four inches of rain, maybe isolated totals up to five to six inches. Then on Saturday, this whole thing goes up the east coast, severe weather possible in the southeast. That more looks like wind damage instead of tornadoes, but that does include areas from Savannah to Charleston. And then to the north, a rainy Saturday evening, especially uh, outside of New York City and Philadelphia is under a flood watch, Tom. In northern New England, they're going to get some snow out of this, too. So we got a little bit of everything with this storm heading up the east coast. Snow mid-March in New England. Okay. We'll yep. be, and meanwhile, we're talking about mowing lawns down here in D.C. pretty <laughs> I soon. Know. Uh, all right, Bill, thanks very much, buddy. In a Michigan courtroom today, the prosecution zeroing in on what the father of a mass school shooter did not tell detectives when he sat down with them to help piece together what happened that day. Let's talk about what James Kermley didn't tell you. He never told you that he bought the murder weapon four days ago, did he? He did not. He never said he bought the murder weapon four days ago as a gift for his son. He did not. He never told you the gun was ever locked up, did he? He did not. He never told you the counselor told James and Jennifer Crumley to take their son home that day, did he? No, he did not. Okay. In fact, he referred to it as doodly on the paper, right? Correct. A lot going on. And right there, that's James Crumley in court today, day four of a rare case when the parent of a mass school shooter is on trial for his child's actions. His son opened fire at Oxford High School in November of 2021, killing these four students and all of them. Missed, as you would imagine, by their friends and family members. James Crumley is facing charges of involuntary manslaughter, one for each of those four students. A jury convicted his wife, Jennifer, on the same charges last month. NBC's Maggie Vespa joins us now with more. Maggie, who else did you hear from today in court? Tom, we heard from several people today. Seemingly among the most impactful was, number one, the manager of a local gun store who said that she was working the day that James Crumbley came into the shop with uh, his son, Ethan Crumley, to shop for a gun. And she talked about seeing the two walking through the store, looking at different guns, Crumbley saying that he had had his eye on one for a long time, and how she said it also came with a cable lock that authorities later said James Crumbley failed to use in securing the gun, allowing his son to get access to it. So that seemed pretty pivotal for the prosecution. We also heard from a computer crimes analyst who talked about text messages that Ethan Crumbley sent to a friend, in particular text saying, that he had asked his parents for help with his mental health and then told his friend, according to this testimony, that his father gave him some pills and told him to, quote, suck it up. We should note, multiple times today, we heard the defense cross-examining these witnesses, kind of pushing back on the prosecution's theory. Here is one such moment specifically tied to those text messages. Take a listen. In April of 21, you testified about... Um, Mr. Crumbly's son telling his friend, I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctor, right? Correct. You don't know what doctor that was? He was talking about hearing voices in the distance and stuff like that, but... You I don't do know not. what doctor that was, is that accurate? Correct. In reviewing the exhibit that we have, we don't know what doctor he was asking to see. Other, I mean, from the word prior to that where he's hearing voices and he feels like he's dying inside, I do not know the doctor. 
We should know this was the first time, uh, Tom, that we heard the defense cross-examining any witnesses today. Uh, it's still the prosecution's case at this point, but it could get handed over to the defense early next week. Uh, Maggie, there was also new information uh, today about a court order that will limit Crumbly's jail communications. He allegedly was making threatening statements. What, what's that all about? Yeah, that came through overnight, and it was the Oakland County Sheriff, the local sheriff's office, who kind of gave us the info about these threats. In short, yesterday, at the end of the day yesterday, after the jury had left the room, the judge issued an order limiting James Crumley's communications, but declined to say in court, as did the prosecution, why they wanted that. And effectively, the sheriff's office later clarified, saying that James Crumley has been making threats, they said, over the phone and via what they called electronic messages. They didn't want to say who he was threatening, when this happened, any of the content of those threats. But then you can see that's the judge's order right there saying now his phone and tablet privileges have effectively been revoked except for communications with his lawyer and with legitimate clergy. So long story short, Tom, he's effectively largely cut off from the outside world through the remainder of this trial. And the trial continues next week. Maggie, thank you very much. The U.S. military says tonight that one of its most troubled aircraft is again cleared for takeoff. It comes just months after eight airmen were killed when a VA-22 Osprey helicopter crashed off the coast of Japan. The November accident marked the fourth fatal crash for the Osprey over just a two-year period, killing a total of 20 members of the service. The military says the latest crash had something to do with the gearbox on the Osprey, but acknowledges it's still not sure why the part failed. Despite that, the military says the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force will resume flights with the Osprey over the coming months. NBC's Courtney QB is following this for us. Take us through this investigation, Courtney. How did investigators determine what caused the, the uh, chopper to actually go down? Yeah, so what's important to remember here, Tom, is while the investigators have determined the part, the material failure of this V-22 Osprey, they are not sharing that publicly yet. And what's also really critical here is the fact that even though they know what caused, what the part on the Osprey was that, that failed, that caused this crash off the coast of Japan in November, they, are, they still don't know why the part failed. Now, NBC News last month reported that the part that failed, the, the issue was within the prop rotor gearbox. That's up at the top of the aircraft. If you're looking at, at a, a, a V-22 Osprey, it's up at the part where sort of the rotor is, where it tilts forward and up. We, according to a number of officials familiar with the investigation, were told that that was what failed. But again, investigators still don't know with full certainty why that part failed. Now, despite that, there has been about a three-month-long investigation here leading military officials today to say that they believe, based on what they know and new procedures they're putting in place, that they can put the aircraft safely back up in the air. Here's how they, they described the process, what they were, they were willing to say about it, was that it, it was a data-driven data -driven approach prioritizing the safety of the air crews. Maintenance and procedural changes have been implemented to address, address the material failure and allow for a safe return to flight. Again, not specifying what that material failure was, Tom. I'm guessing that the reason for that, unlike a civilian aircraft, is there are military secrets. You don't want to advertise what your vulnerability is with a particular uh, piece of equipment that you rely on every day. That said, um, is the Osprey that's had so many problems, Courtney, is it, is it too big, too important to fail for the military? Yeah, so the, it, there's no question that this is a very critical aircraft for the Marine Corps. They have more than about 350 of them. They were flying them every single day, and it's so important that, in fact, NBC News first reported that back in January, they actually put a number of them back up in the air despite this grounding for what they called operational necessity. Now, the Marines are very quick to point out when they put those aircraft back up in the air, specifically in, uh, in Djibouti and a couple of other locations in very small numbers, that they started implementing these new procedures that include more included more maintenance checks it included the pilot refreshers you can see there on the screen it's what the marines are calling a walk a crawl walk run approach to slowly phasing the aircraft back in and i will say since they put them back in the air in Djibouti, there have not been any safety problems with these new procedures at this point tom courtney cuby has been on the story breaking developments courtney thank you very much 
Coming up, the U.S. government says no, it did not cover up the existence of UFOs. What it says people have really been seeing in the skies. Don't believe your lying eyes. Plus, what the National Park Service says, literally moved a lake, moved a lake miles away. That's when we come back. One of the world's biggest companies says it just can't seem to kick Russian spies out of its computer systems. We're talking about Microsoft. In a blog posted in the last few hours, the company says Russian hackers, apparently known as Midnight Buzzard, make that Midnight Blizzard, have gained access to digital secrets, including source codes, basically the script for Microsoft's programs, as well as internal emails. The hacking group allegedly has ties to Russia's version of the National Security Agency and is thought to be behind some of the biggest hacks in U.S. history. NBC's Kevin Collier just posted this story to NBCNews.com. So one would think Microsoft has pretty robust security protocols in place. Why is it struggling to kick Russia, Russians, out of its system? We're not the only one asking that. A lot of critics are, are pointing to the fact that this is a company that uh, it's one of the most sophisticated tech companies in the world that uh, you would maybe want better. But at the same time, you know, this is one of those things where this is Russia's A team, the, the group that's being accused here. It's, it's like you said, the equivalent of the, of the U.S. NSA. And in cyber terms, they often refer to nation state hacking groups as as APT, Advanced Persistent Threats. And these guys are really persistent. They have been absolutely dogged at it, per Microsoft's description, since November, just constantly trying to get in. And, and why are the hackers specifically targeting Microsoft? Do we know that? Well, you know, I spoke with uh, Adam Myers, the vice president at CrowdStrike, um, and he pointed out, look, Microsoft has enormous government contracts. They do a bunch of AI work, but they also have government contracts with the U.S. government, all kinds of NATO governments, governments around the world. And if you want to look at Russia as a potential election interferer, you know, that's a lot of intelligence. All right, Kevin, thank you very much. A lot going on there with uh, Mr. Softy, as we used to say, covering it on Wall Street, Microsoft. Thanks very much, Kevin. Thanks, Let's sir. get you over now to the five things our team thinks you may want to know about tonight. Number one, a deadly crash in Wisconsin shut down part of a highway there today. Police say a semi-tractor and a trailer hit a van at an intersection. At least one person died. Police are investigating and say that they will get more details as they become available. Number two, three fugitives are charged with capital murder and the likely deaths of an American couple thrown off their own yacht in the Caribbean. We reported this a few weeks ago. Police say the three inmates escaped from prison in Grenada, then hijacked the yacht and probably tossed those two people overboard. Police say it's unlikely the couple survived. Number three, George Santos. You may remember him, the one who was kicked out of Congress and charged with defrauding campaign donors. He says he's running again. He will face off against another Republican in a Long Island district. Santos pleaded not guilty to lying to Congress and using campaign donations illegally for personal expenses. His felony trial set for September after the primary. Number four, a United Airlines plane rolled off the runway at Houston Intercontinental today after landing from Memphis. More than 160 people were on board. Nobody heard. The FAA is investigating. It's been a tough week for United. One plane had to make an emergency landing after flames shot out of the engine, probably in a stall. Another plane had a tire right there fall off as it left San Francisco for Japan. That's not supposed to happen. Number four, strong winds in Death Valley National Park literally blew a lake two miles. Yes, you heard that right. 40 mile an hour winds over a few days pushed Lake Manly north. It moved back to its original spot, but it is now shallower and muddier. The National Park Service won't let people boat there anymore, at least not for now. When we come back, the biggest name in college basketball right now getting ready for her biggest game, really the game's biggest game tonight. How Caitlin Clark's surging popularity is driving sold out crowds to the Big Ten's women's tournament. Plus, why videos about government jobs are getting millions of views from young job, job seekers on TikTok working for the government. Coming up.
We're back, and a new jobs report out today shows that more jobs were added in February than expected, with 275,000 new jobs showing pretty good signs of a job market that is strong. However, that good news, really, it's colliding with some other potentially worrisome news. A report found that layoffs in February hit the highest level for that month since the financial crisis back in 2009. And numbers like that concern anybody looking for a job. However, Gen Z and young millennials, they found a little hack, if you will, to give them some job security. NBC's Julie Serkin has that story. If you're on social media, chances are you've seen these videos all over your For You page. I'm pretty sure I'm getting laid off today. Job cuts, no matter the industry, can be found all over the headlines. So, to avoid being just another one of the more than 160,000 layoffs this year alone, Gen Z and millennials found a little hack, calling it quits on the private sector and going public. Many looking to lock down government jobs for security. Public service was something I always wanted to do besides the benefits, but also one of the reasons is because you were not going to get laid off versus private sector. 77% of the class of 2024 say they're more likely to apply to a job that promises stability. And that's what a government job offers. We have to have a government. If we don't, our society is in trouble and our democracy as well. So it's not that your jobs are forever necessarily but certainly the organization is there. Salaried workers in the public sector hold their jobs for three more years on average than in private. And the younger generation is beginning to notice. Hashtag government jobs on TikTok has more than 23 million views. We need to start applying to jobs with the federal government. On a popular career site for college kids, federal jobs receive twice as many applications. The paycheck is probably smaller. On average, federal workers earned about 22% less than private sector workers with similar roles. But for many, the benefits are the selling point. Good health insurance, retiring early with a pension. Plus, after a decade, student loans are wiped clean for many. That's a perk nearly 70% say will influence their decisions. And of course, there's the work-life balance. You do your job nine to five and then you can enjoy your life after work and do what you want to do. But right now, less than 8% of federal workers are younger than 30 and nearly half are over 50. The challenge, though, is that the leaders in government don't often prioritize creating the opportunities for young people, ensuring that, that the managers know how to manage uh, Gen Z and millennials. And, and making sure the process itself is not overly onerous. Tamayo says the long process can be a big turnoff. I tell them that it's going to take a minute, and when they say, what do you mean a minute? I'm like five to six months. And they get very discouraged by it. But for him, it's worth it. You just have to be patient because at the end of the day, you're going to get a secure job where you're not going to get laid off. All right, let's bring in Julie Serkin, who has more on this. You know, government jobs, kind of a hot-button issue, right, up there on the hill. How does politics play into all of this? Of course it does, Tom. It definitely is a hot-button issue. And right now, under President Biden, certainly working for the government might sound like a good idea. This jobs report you were talking about that came out today, 52,000 of those jobs were government jobs. That's about consistent with the monthly average we've seen over the last year. But here's the thing. Former President Donald Trump, who is likely going to be the Republican nominee for president facing off against Biden, he's promising to slash government jobs, slash government spending. That's something you see Republicans up here hammering Democrats about constantly. Right now, actually, the Senate is passing the government funding bills. Uh, this is an area in which Republicans are constantly saying, let's spend less, therefore potentially shrinking the amount of jobs in the government workforce in that space. And so certainly you could see a change happen when it comes to the November election. But so far, you heard Brandon Tamayo say this is an industry that he is looking to join in terms of the public sector. You saw those videos on TikTok. Certainly young kids especially, they're looking for that stability and security that public sector jobs can offer. By the way, there's some irony here, right? Uh, the, the kids are, uh, the young people are on TikTok because they want a government job, and yet the government is trying to shut down TikTok. Has anybody That's caught true. that cycle? <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's Julie, a good point, Doug.
Thank you very much, Julie Serkin. All right, do you ever find that there's just too much news to keep track of? Well, you're in luck. Our bureau teams have boiled it down for you and for me some of the headlines from their regions. This is what they tell us is going down, and we call this segment the local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, police arrested a former convict turned criminal justice advocate after they found a human torso in a New York apartment. The suspect previously spent 25 years in prison for attempted murder, but recently spoke out about turning his life around. He's now pleading not guilty to multiple charges, including murder. Also from our Northeast Bureau, firefighters battled a massive fire in New Jersey at what is believed to be a former cardboard warehouse. Huge smoke and flames there. Nobody injured. The case is under investigation. And out of our Southern Bureau, federal prosecutors say a former Jacksonville Jaguars employee used team money to find, make that fund, a life of luxury. Now, remember, Amit Patel pleaded guilty in December to stealing more than $20 million from the team. Prosecutors say he spent it on things like a putter used by Tiger Woods, private jets. Patel's lawyer claims his actions were fueled by his gambling addiction, and he is set to be sentenced next week. In just under an hour, the biggest star in college basketball will hit the biggest stage again. Caitlin Clark kicks off her elusive title chase tonight. It starts in Minneapolis with her Iowa Hawkeyes against Penn State at the Big Ten's women's basketball tournament. And for the record, we checked the ticket websites. The men's tournament still has thousands of unsold tickets. But for the women, no luck, sold out for the first time ever. And the Big Ten expects this year's crowd to more than double last year's record attendance. Pretty much of all of it, thanks to Clark, now the sport's all-time leading scorer, male or female, surpassing Pistol Pete just this week. NBC Shaquille Brewster is following all of this for us from shit. I hope, well, are you going to get a seat tonight or not? If you're in Chicago, you're not in Minneapolis. I wish. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, Clark, Clark, is, time, I wish. <laughs> Clark is driving this just insane burst of popularity in the women's game and the TV numbers as well, right? That's exactly right. And look, you know, that game that we saw where Caitlin Clark, Clark broke that scoring record, that was a record-setting game. It was the first time that you saw that many people watching a game, a uh, college women's basketball game since 1999. And when you look at the what the other sports and the other games that uh, it's competing with, look at this full screen. Uh, she's in pretty good company because the other games that are at the top of that list, you're talking about holiday games. You're talking about in-state tournament games. And you see that March 3rd game got 3.39 million viewers. And Tom, look, it's not just on TV. The Big Ten Conference quarterfinals is happening tonight. I was looking at some local coverage there. Again, I'm not in Minneapolis. I wish I was able to get a ticket, but I guess I'm not that lucky. But I was look looking at some coverage from a local reporter there. You had fans lining up outside and inside of that stadium from earlier than 6 a.m. today. Tip-off is at 5.30 p.m. tonight. So oh, no. it's a, a no. lot of excitement there in Minneapolis as people are excited for this game. I'm sorry. I won't even do that for the Rolling Stones. And I love the Rolling Stones. <laughs> but listen, you know, there's this old adage in basketball, right? It's a team sport. We know Clark reached the national yeah. title game last year but lost. Can her success alone lift Iowa to a championship? If you look at least to what you saw last year, the answer is no. Of course, uh, you saw Iowa losing to LSU despite Caitlin Clark getting some 30 points, 30, 31 points in that game. But let's look at what our friends at FanDuel are saying right now about this overall NCAA uh, women's tournament. You see the South Carolina Gamecocks, they are the favorite to win the title there, but uh, LSU and Iowa are not too far behind them. And look, anything can happen. I should note that with the game that we're going to see Iowa and Caitlin Clark play tonight, because we're in that single elimination uh, series or timing of these tournaments, uh, it could potentially be Caitlin Clark's final college basketball game. We know that she's said she's going to enter the WNBA or at least uh, enter in for the draft. It would be no, it would be a shock if she didn't make it into the uh, league. But it could potentially be her final game if she does lose, which is not expected, Tom.
Yeah, no, no, that's not going to happen. Okay, buddy, thank you very much. Shaq Brewster watching it all from Chicago. A new Pentagon report out today says there is no credible evidence that the U.S. government covered up the existence of UFOs or other alien life. It's a 63-page report, and it says a lot of people who thought they saw something, maybe E.T. flying through the sky, it was probably just a mix-up. The report says, quote, most sightings were the result of misidentification of ordinary objects and aerial phenomena. In addition to nixing the idea of a cover-up, the report shoots down a lot of the allegations made by so-called believers, including that there's ever been a verified sighting of an alien UFO. NBC's Gotti Schwartz joins me now. Gotti, you're from New Mexico. There are aliens buried there, I think. Oh, you've got the report. Okay, good. So listen. <laughs> I've got the, the report. Tom, this is the, the best Pentagon, reading of, the, the, of any Friday. Okay, good. Well, the Pentagon is basically saying that despite all the decades of reports, you know, coming from the Air Force, coming from ordinary citizens, it's a bunch of nothing? Kind of. They're basically saying that the most wild allegations that we've heard so far are a bunch of nothing, specifically those claims that the U.S. government is in possession of alien bodies and crashed UFOs, and there was some big cover-up about it. As a New Mexican, I'm very sad about that. <laughs> uh, but they do say that they interviewed 30 people who were named as knowing about these alleged secret programs or might have seen something firsthand or had access to that information. They had some names. None of it turned up any actual proof and said they say a lot of this stuff came from a very small circle of people within the government. They were kind of repeating rumors to each other and then things got mixed up because of a lot of secrecy, a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, one perfect example, and I think you'll like this one, uh, they talked to someone who had allegedly touched an alien craft, or at least they were told, this person with this name, you go talk to him, he's touched a craft. Well, Arrow says they tracked that person down he said he didn't remember saying that, but he had touched a super secret stealth bomber back in the day. So that might have been the explanation there. As for all this recent stuff we've been seeing, we were hoping for some specifics. I have gone through this twice now. Uh, it is a fascinating read. But this report attributes them to a long list of generalities, like experimental aircraft, high-altitude balloons, there's satellites, rockets, flares, optical illusions, uh, drones, uh, planes, birds, stars, you name it. No mention yeah. of swamp gas in here, but pretty much everything else. Tom? You know, there is there is an irony here, right? I mean, the government itself is saying that there was no government cover-up. Cover up. And, and, you know, critics are going to say, well, yeah, that's exactly what they would say. Um, but I've often wondered, you know, did anybody spot a UFO in the, in the 19th century? Or is this a 20th, 21st century phenomenon? In other words, did we only start thinking about UFOs when we became really aware of Mars and other planets and started thinking about life beyond Earth? If you talk to the people that are close to this, they say that pre-1947, 1947 was the, the, and it's in this report, was the first report of a flying sw uh, saucer from a pilot. Pre-1947, pre-nuclear age, uh, they were angels. People would see stuff in the sky, but they would attribute it to angels or celestial bodies or like all kinds of weird other stuff. And then after 1947, anything that was unidentified in the air became flying saucers. So who knows? I do know that the DOD is developing this Pelican case full of sensors that they are going to deploy anytime there's uh, a report of UFOs or a hotspot of UFOs. They're calling these kits gremlin kits, and they're filled with sensors to collect hard data. Data, so maybe we'll get some some proof sometime soon. You never know, Tom. Yeah, I know. But being a New Mexican, <laughs> I've been to that that where is that spot in the desert where they have these green Roswell. I've been to Roswell. Got, um, Roswell, Trinity. There's all kinds of. Right? I mean, the Roswell is just for beginners. New Mexico has a long history of all this, and a lot of it goes back to the, the Manhattan Project. Ah, there you go. And Al, oh, you're tying into the uh, to the award ceremony. I see what you're doing there. Okay, thank you. We got Oppenheim, right? Sure. We got Oppenheim. All right, Gotti, thank you, you go. very much. All right, be sure to catch Gotti on his show. Stay tuned now, later tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And isn't he a fine-looking guy? 8 p.m. Eastern Time on News Now. Back now with tonight's original with in-depth reporting on topics we keep an eye on around here. And tonight, it's the humanitarian crisis in Gaza growing worse by the hour. That temporary port in Gaza that President Biden announced last night, we're just learning it could take up to 60 days to be fully operational. That 
according to two senior U.S. officials. The U.S. is hoping that the floating dock can help with food and, su and supplies arriving from the Mediterranean directly into Gaza. In, in the meantime, the situation for civilians growing more dire by the day, by the hour, especially for children, many now younger than the war itself. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald has more. The agony and devastation that's gripping Gaza is deepening. But it's the most vulnerable who are paying the heaviest price. The innocence of children stripped away as thousands become casualties of this war. Those who have survived so far are left with immeasurable trauma. Safety Children has been around for over 100 years. We work in all the big crises in the world. This is by far the worst situation, especially for children. A situation so dire, starving children are now forced to eat animal feed, ground up into patties. Cages for animals turned into beds for children. Trapped in the middle of unspeakable horrors, as the UN frantically warns, Gaza is on the brink of famine. The Gaza Health Ministry says at least 20 people have died, over a dozen of them children, in just over a week from starvation and dehydration. For those kids lucky enough to escape, like Emily Abu Hamid and her five kids, life goes on. We first met the family in Cairo just hours after they escaped Gaza when Americans were allowed to leave. How has life been since you've come back to the United Kingdom? Surreal, uh, a bit difficult to just adjust to normal life. We're just struggling to, to get back to some type of normal, I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, all the family we left behind, which is just constantly on our mind. Survivor's guilt haunts her entire family, especially her 10-year-old twin boys. I think you had mentioned that you didn't want to go to the park. Why not? Because I feel bad for my family in Gaza, because if they try to go outside, they could be, like, hurt and stuff and feel bad. Their older cousin, Ibrahim, was their best friend. The family says he died in an Israeli drone strike the day after Christmas while walking on a street in Gaza. It was his 13th birthday. It rips your heart out because they should be kids and they should play. UNICEF says more than a million children in Gaza need mental health support, but with almost no access to specialist doctors, these makeshift trauma tents meant to be a safe space for kids to just be kids for even just a moment. The UN says the chronic exposure to violence may be sowing the seeds of aggression, saying the parents of these kids say that they're scared because they see what it is like for them, that there are fewer alternatives to armed resistance, and it's difficult to keep the kids away from that path because so many hopes have been destroyed. Trauma psychologists have termed it a continuous traumatic stress disorder. That is going to fuel in the hearts of these kids that I want to revenge maybe for my parents. I'm writing about something that hasn't been discussed or spoken about, the suicide that Palestinian kids were committing before the war 2023. Why? Is because of they've been stripped out of everything good in life. But for Emily's oldest daughter, Nora, for her, healing is living her life for the thousands of children who will never get the chance. I do my best and I work my hardest for them because I was able to leave. I'm, I'm not going to waste the opportunity that I have, my education, and I'm going to study and work hard for them. Right now, UNICEF says there are at least 17,000 kids in Gaza who have lost either one or both of their parents or have been separated from them. So these kids are now orphans. And the concern here is that number will only grow as this war rages on. Back to you. Okay, Megan, thank you very much. Megan Fitzgerald. And we'll be right back. We never quit. We're back. Top of the hour on News Now. And we are kicking it off with that fiery President Biden taking his vision for the state of our union on the road. Right now, he's speaking at a key battleground state. We are live at the White House with what his supporters are saying about the performance last night and what they expect going forward. And then the backlash against TikTok. Congress gearing up 
for a veto, a, vo a vote rather, to ban the popular app, a veto of sorts, unless it cuts ties with its Chinese-owned parent company, how users are fighting back, trying to save TikTok here at home. Also, new tonight, tornado watches across the South, uh, millions facing dangerous weather. We will show you where in just a few minutes. Plus, the Pentagon giving the thumbs up to let a helicopter involved in a series of deadly crashes fly again. The big question now, have they figured out what went wrong with the Osprey and how to prevent future astronauts? And the biggest star in college basketball on the court just 30 minutes away, how Caitlin Clark is fueling a new generation of fans coming up later in the show. You've heard of her, right? Good day, I'm Tom Costello, in for Hallie on this Friday. And as we speak, President Biden is taking the show on the road, hitting the campaign trail less than 24 hours after a speech that many think might have been the political life raft he needed. Right now, you're looking live at the president talking just outside of his adopted home city of Philadelphia, and already we're hearing him tackle the same themes from his fiery State of the Union address last night, where he laid out his plan of attack against former President Donald Trump and made the case that his age, 81, is not the number to focus on. Rather, it's four. He wants four more years in the White House. This trip kicks off a week of campaigning both for him and for the vice president, going to all of the critical battleground states they had need to win in November. Here they are, Georgia, of course. We've also got Arizona. We've got Nevada, Wisconsin, Michigan, New Hampshire, and Pennsylvania, as you see. And we are told to expect the same themes, spinning his age as experience you only get with age going after Mr. Trump and Republicans for the January 6th insurrection. And what he says is inaction in Congress on multiple levels, sharpening his message on reproductive rights as well, and talking up what he says is America's economic comeback. He will likely be riding a wave of good jobs numbers out today, beating expectations. We'll talk more about the new stats in just a moment, but there they are, and the unemployment rate still near a 50-year low. And you see the poll right here, Americans who watch the speech, they're reacting mostly positively. Nearly two-thirds say they had a positive reaction. Our Monica Alba spoke with supporters near Philadelphia who are thrilled, they say, with his speech. I was so happy I jumped out of my seat at the end. He was awesome. He was powerful. He got his point across. He stood strong. He looked like a president. And uh, that's what we needed. All right. Well, those are Dems. Republicans probably have a different view. NBC's Ali Rafa is outside the White House. And so far, uh, we're hearing him use a lot of the same lines that he used last night on the economy on January 6th. Reproductive rights. Talk us through what you're hearing. Yeah, Tom, the president just a few minutes ago starting to speak uh, to this very friendly crowd in suburban Philadelphia after a very enthusiastic introduction by First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, where she delivered arguably her sharpest criticism yet uh, that we've seen from her uh, in regards to former President Trump and what he did during his uh, first term in office. And the president, after that introduction, immediately, he did not waste any time going after his predecessor. Uh, he says that freedoms are going to be on the ballot in 2024. He immediately talked about January 6th and the former president's role on that day. Uh, and then he started talking about his guests at the State of the Union last night, directly related uh, to the fallout of the reversal of Roe v. Wade that he blamed on former President Trump and his three Supreme Court picks while in office. Take a listen to a bit of his comments here. I'm Pennsylvania. I have a message for you. Send me to Congress that I can support this right. And I promise you, if we take back Congress, we, we will restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land. And the Biden team says this is much of what we can expect moving forward as the president tries to continue this momentum uh, started after his State of the Union address last night, uh, trying to really, as you said, spin those arguments about age, about mental fitness, about his ability to work across the aisle and get bipartisan legislation uh, passed and also to uh, to save Americans more money, really spreading that economic message. So the Biden team says this is much of what we can expect to see from the president as the general election campaign. Campaign really kicks into high gear, Tom.
You know, we know the Biden campaign has been praising the fundraising this week, particularly since Nikki Haley dropped out of the Republican primary. What's the latest now on how how this is all gone, how the fundraising has gone since last night? Yeah, the Biden team is very pleased with how voters received this address last night. They say that the hours uh, during the State of the Union address were their best fundraising hours since the campaign was launched last April, setting historic records. Uh, and they also announced today that they're going to be launching this new six-week-long $30 million campaign ads uh, blitz in battleground states. Also, as you mentioned at the top there, this blitz of travel by the president, vice president as well, as administration officials to battleground states over the coming weeks, Tom. Ali, really quickly, has um, the message sunk in that he needs to be as robust and energetic and passionate and angry or whatever uh, on the campaign trail as he was last night? The message has definitely sunk in among Biden staffers. The question now is whether it, whether voters will actually understand that and really make a difference in how they're going to be turning out. Because remember, the general election is going to be a, a game of turnout and how the Biden team can galvanize voters and get them excited enough and enthusiastic enough to go out and vote in November. So it's, you know, the, the president could be as enthusiastic as he wants. Whether voters accept that and act on it is the big question, Tom. Good point, Ali. Thank you very much. Tonight, former President Trump is expected to sit down with the Prime Minister of Hungary, a meeting out of a scene from his days as president, bringing together the two men most associated with conservatism or an extreme version of it on their respective continents. The Hungarian PM, Viktor Orban, is a longtime ally, ally of former President Trump and a tolerated ally in NATO, the military alliance Mr. Trump bashes and has continued to bash throughout his campaign. Orban is often compared to Mr. Trump, among other reasons, for Orban's anti-immigrant statements and policies. NBC's Von Hilliard is following this for us. Vaughn, uh, presidential candidates don't usually get visits at their homes from foreign leaders, and Orban is widely accused of being an authoritarian. Why would Trump be sitting down with him now? Donald Trump, Tom, views Viktor Orban as not only a foreign ally, but also one here domestically. I can tell you from having conversations with voters on the ground, you hear folks talk about Orban because, frankly, Donald Trump brings him up quite often on the campaign trail, suggesting that uh, in many ways, uh, leaders around the country need to emulate the Hungarian leader. If you just look at some of the comparisons between the two, take a look at their comments on immigration, for example. Donald Trump suggesting that uh, immigrants poison the blood of the country. Orban suggesting, quote, we do not want to become a mixed race on it. Excuse me, on NATO, Russia can do whatever the hell they want, Donald Trump suggested last month when he pushed these NATO countries to pay up more toward their own national defense. And of course, just here in the last month, uh, uh, the final country to approve Sweden being uh, uh, becoming a member of NATO. And then when you're looking at democracy, of course, Donald Trump repeatedly uh, making his election denial claims and compared to Viktor Orban, who has also been at the forefront, he is now serving a fourth term in office. For Donald Trump, having Viktor Orban come to Florida is very telling. It was in New Hampshire at a campaign rally just back in New, in New Hampshire back in January, Tom, when Donald Trump said from the stage that Viktor Orban was a great leader and a strong leader and making the case that that's why a lot of people don't like him. Donald Trump then went on to say, quote, it's nice to have a strong man running your country. Of course, Democrats have expressed fears that Donald Trump intends to be a strong man and uh, in much in the way that Viktor Orban has overseen in a liberal democracy, uh, having a leader here in the United States that tries to emulate him. Well, he's virtually quashed democracy in Hungary. It's pretty much a one-party state right now. He also controls the media. Uh, by the way, just yesterday, Sweden officially joined NATO after Orban and Hungary finally lifted that block. If Mr. Trump is reelected, there's already talk that he and Orban could undermine NATO, even as the Russia threat is growing more serious. 
Right, and this is you heard from Joe Biden last night in his State of the Union address, concerns about the state of democracy, but also the role that the U.S. plays uh, overseas and as part of the NATO alliance. Sweden is now the 36th, uh, 32nd member of NATO, but it was Hungary who was the final member country to hold up approving Sweden to become a part of NATO. And when you look at the EU and international support for uh, Ukraine, aid to Ukraine and their efforts to defend the country from Russia, it was just just here in the last month, that finally under pressure that Viktor Orban in Hungary was the final EU country to sign off on $50 billion in aid going from the EU to Ukraine. Of course, Donald Trump has been at the forefront of uh, expressing concern or hesitancy from the U.S. continuing to provide aid to Ukraine. So Donald Trump views Orban, if he were to get back into the White House, as a leader on that front. Yeah, Orban is also very close to uh, Vladimir Putin. Vaughn, thank you. It's Von Hilliard, of course, in Houston. Next week, the House is set to vote on a bill that could get TikTok banned in the United States. And that has a lot of users of the app very upset. It's a bipartisan bill aiming to get TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, to sell the app or make it unavailable in the United States. Now, remember, ByteDance is based out of Beijing, and the chief concern from lawmakers in the United States and critics is protecting U.S. data from the Chinese government. ByteDance says it is a private company not owned or controlled by the Chinese government. The bills got the support of the House Speaker and it just advanced out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee with a 50 to nothing vote. TikTok, TikTok is trying to fight back, sending out this notification to users who are 18 and older, asking them to call their representatives to tell them to vote no on the bill. And it seems to be working. We're hearing from some lawmakers who tell our team that their offices have been flooded with phone calls from angry constituents. NBC's Brian Chung joins me now. Brian, talk us through this bill now and the kind of impact it could have, you know, to underscore this, if you're a a teen, a 20-something, you love TikTok. Yeah, well, and that's the reason why so many of these campaign, or rather some of these congressional offices were getting flooded with calls yesterday. But let's unpack exactly what's being proposed here. So again, this bill passed the uh, House uh, Com Commerce Committee yesterday. And what it proposes to do is to force the uh, holding company, which is a Chinese company known as ByteDance, to sell TikTok within 180 days of the enactment of the bill. It also offers a narrow process for the executive branch to do so as well. But it's really that first prong that would be used uh, in this this law to essentially force ByteDance to sell the company. If it doesn't do so within six months, the entire app would be banned nationwide. It is a bipartisan bill, which suggests that, and now that it's advanced from the committee, once it does face a four, full floor vote, which the House Majority Leader says will come sometime next week, that it could face full passage. Uh, take a listen to what uh, Representative Jeffries on the Democratic side said with regards to momentum on this bill. That is impressive in nature in any instance, but particularly as it relates to something in the social media space, which hasn't always been easy for Democrats and Republicans to find common ground. That was House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. And again, he's talking about that 50 to 0 vote out of the committee. Very unprecedented in this Congress, but it just shows, Tom, they're all appearing on the same side, uh, at least on this front. Yeah, you know, we mentioned the campaign that TikTok is underway, it has underway right now to get users on its side. My gosh, they're running TV commercials showing nuns uh, using TikTok. Uh, what else is TikTok uh, bite dance saying? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a full blitz from the company trying to get people, their users, to call their congressperson to say, vote this down. In a statement, TikTok did say uh, the following. This legislation has a predetermined outcome, a total ban of TikTok in the United States. They say this will destroy the people who are building livelihoods. They're selling uh, things on TikTok. We spoke with one person who said uh, they built a whole uh, livelihood out of selling trinkets that they uh, really promote through their thousands of followers on TikTok. So TikTok is trying to lean into those types of users to drive the political rhetoric to shoot down this type of legislation. But whether or not it's successful, again, it's a bipartisan push here. And we have to acknowledge if it passes the House, once it gets to the Senate, we've also heard that the White House seems to be in uh, support of this because we've heard the National Security Council say uh, they think that this is a good step. So we'll have to see how this develops, Tom. Really is an amazing development. And by the way, some of these TikTokers, they go on to get TV roles, movie roles. They I do. mean, this thing has taken on a life of its own. Yep. Brian, thank you very much. To the skies we go now, and right now a tornado watch is in effect for parts of the south 
as they brace for what could be a very dangerous evening with severe thunderstorms moving across the region. Six million people are at risk from intense storms. Look at that. Stretching all the way from Texas to Georgia. On top of that, 14 million people in that same area under flood watches. NBC's Bill Carrance is watching all of this. Bill, it's been an hour since we talked. Give us the latest now, and what are you seeing? Yeah, an hour ago, Tom, we had a tornado warning that was in effect. It was radar indicated. It has since fallen apart. We haven't heard any confirmation of any damage or anything, so it may have never been on the ground, which is great. We still have our tornado watch. means tornadoes are possible till at least 9 o'clock this evening from an area from New Orleans here into southern Mississippi in a section here of Alabama. Flash flooding, though, is by far the biggest life-threatening risk out there now. We've had numerous flash flood warnings here. The new one is in the Hattiesburg area. They, are just, they had a severe thunderstorm warning. Now now they're under a flash flood warning, torrential rain, and this evening that heads through Alabama and all through Georgia and even South Carolina has a few spots that are now in this flash flood watch. Additional rainfall, easily two to three inches. Someone by the time that's done tomorrow morning could get up to a half a foot of rain, especially any thunderstorms that are training in the same areas. And then tomorrow, wash out in the mid-Atlantic, severe storms possible in the southeast, and then late in the day that rain and eventually snow goes into the northeast. So here's the severe weather risk tomorrow, Tallahassee, Jacksonville, Savannah. Anna, Charleston, Myrtle Beach, up to Wilmington, including Augusta, Georgia. Flash flood watch is up for Philadelphia, outside of New York City in the suburbs, and then from the areas in New Hampshire here into southern Massachusetts. And we're going to get a lot of rain, especially Saturday evening, and then during the overnight hours, about one, one and a half inches. This is on top of the rain event we just had. And at the highest of elevations, it's going to snow tomorrow evening, and it'll be a plowable snow, too. You can almost draw the mountains here. So this is the White Mountains here in New Hampshire. This is the Green Mountains going down through the spine of Vermont. This is the Adirondacks of upstate New York and then so a little bit in the Catskills. But uh, yeah, there hasn't been a lot of snow in this region. If the, Tom, people were thinking ski season was going to end early. This may extend it another week or two. You know what always amazes me? Look at your map behind you. There's never any weather in Canada. It's Isn't always amazing. It's like it's beautiful up there. Never a problem. It's only down here. It's a stencil. <laughs> <laughs> My Canadian friends always roll their eyes at our weather I maps. Know. All right. I've, I've argued for them, but I get outruled. <laughs> Bill, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, in a Michigan courtroom today, the prosecution zeroing in on what the father of a mass school shooter did not tell detectives when he sat down with detectives to help piece together what happened that day. Take a listen. Let's talk about what James Kermley didn't tell you. He never told you that he bought the murder weapon four days ago, did he? He did not. He never said he bought the murder weapon four days ago as a gift for his son. He did not. He never told you the gun was ever locked up, did he? He did not. He never told you the counselor told James and Jennifer Kermley to take their son home that day, did he? No, he did not. Okay, in fact, he referred to it as doodly on the paper, right? Correct. Okay, well, that man right there is James Crumbly in court today. Day four of a rare case when the parent of a mass school shooter is on trial for their child's actions. His son opened fire at Oxford High School in November of 2021, killing four students. And as you know, their families and their friends miss them terribly. James Crumbly is facing charges of involuntary manslaughter. Again, he's the father, one for each of those four students. A jury convicted his wife already, Jennifer, on the same charges. NBC's Maggie Vespa joins me now. Maggie, uh, what else did you hear today that stood out to you in court? Yeah, as a time we heard from several witnesses today, including, for instance, the manager of a local gun store where authorities say James Crumbly, and she testified to this, bought what police say what would become the murder weapon, uh, going shopping at the gun store with his son, bringing Ethan in with him. She testified about seeing father and son picking out a gun together and about the cable lock that came with the gun that authorities later said James Crumbly did not use to secure it, allowing Ethan, his son, to get a hold of it and bring it to school that fateful day. We should note one thing that really stood out to us. We heard a lot of cross-examination, a lot of pushing back for the first time from the defense today. This was day two of testimony, so it was a first for them. One exchange that really stuck out was with a crime, a computer crimes analyst who testified about different text messages that Ethan had sent a close friend of his. For instance, in one case, the analyst testified Ethan texted his friend that he had asked his parents to help him get help for his mental health, but that his father told him to take pills and, quote, suck it up. Here is how James Crumbly's defense attorney tried to kind of poke holes uh, in that testimony. Take a listen. In April of 21, you testified about um, Mr. Crumbly's son telling his friend, I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctor, right? Correct. 
You don't know what doctor that was. He was talking about hearing voices and distance and stuff like that, but... You I don't do know not. what doctor that was. Is that accurate? Correct. In reviewing the exhibit that we have, we don't know what doctor he was asking to see. Other, I mean, from the word prior to that where he's hearing voices and he feels like he's dying inside, I do not know the doctor. We heard a lot of exchanges like that today. Um, also on another note, and Tom, we've been talking about this throughout the day, James Crumbly, the 47-year-old father, the defendant in this case, finding himself kind of in legal hot water of a different kind after the judge at the end of the day yesterday granted uh, uh, the prosecution's request to, to basically restrict James Crumbly's communication greatly from inside jail, basically saying that he can now only communicate with his lawyer and what the court calls legitimate clergy. And all this stems, according to the local sheriff's office, from threats that James Crumbly made, they say, via phone and via what they call electronic messages. They wouldn't say who he threatened or when that happened. But basically now, as a result, James Crumbly is effectively largely closed off to the outside world for the remainder, Tom, of this trial. Maggie, thank you very much for staying on top of it. The U.S. military says tonight that one of the most troubled aircraft in its arsenal is again clear for takeoff. It comes just months after eight airmen were killed when a VA-22 Osprey helicopter crashed off the coast of Japan. The November accident marked the fourth fatal crash for the Osprey over just a two-year period, killing a total of 20 service members. The military says the latest crash had something to do with the gearbox on the Osprey, but acknowledges it is still not sure why a part failed. Despite that, the military says the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force will resume flying the Osprey over the coming months. NBC's Courtney Kuby has been breaking developments on the investigation into this crash. Courtney, what kind of approach is the military taking now going forward to make sure that these helicopter plane combo vehicles, which are very unique, that they're actually safe to fly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely unique. You're, you're right about that, Tom. So the military has not completed this, the investigation into this most recent crash in Japan. It was late November. They, the military grounded all Ospreys across the fleet for about three months. They have determined what the material failure was. So basically what the part on the aircraft was that, that failed causing that fatal crash. But according to a number of military officials, they've not determined with full certainty what caused that part to crash. And in fact, Tom, you mentioned that it had to do with the tilt rotor gearbox. The military is not even saying that yet, that part yet. NBC News has been reporting that for a number of weeks, though. But again, they still don't know what caused the failure of that. Now, in, a, in, in order to put the aircraft back up in the air, the services have implemented a number of additional procedures. The first is some enhanced maintenance checks. That's before the aircraft even go up. The maintainers on the ground, the mechanics, will do some additional checks to make sure that the aircraft is safe to fly. In addition to that, they will start sort of retraining the trainers or going through some of the instructors to try to, to get them requalified or re, uh, ready again to go back in the air. The overall process before we'll see the entire fleet back up in the air will probably take until about summer, the military calling it a phased approach to get them back in the air. But the reality is they are also acknowledging that there will be some limitations on the aircraft going forward while they continue this investigation. But for operational security reasons, they're not identifying exactly what those limitations are, Tom. Yeah, understood. Listen, 20 people killed over two years. However, Courtney, you know, there have been problems with the Osprey going back 20 years or more. Um, and I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. why is the Navy, why, why is the Pentagon sticking with the Osprey when it's got such a troubled history? Does it need the Osprey that badly? I've talked to family members who have a, you know, a, a kid who flies choppers and planes. They don't want that kid flying an Osprey. So that's actually, it's a different answer for different services. The Air Force and the Navy, they only have a handful of them. The reality is they've been able to maintain their operations without much of a hiccup throughout this grounding. The Marine Corps is a different case, though. They have about 350 of these. They are really their main people mover when it comes to a, to a, a, a rotor aircraft, so a, potent, a, a helicopter, and we know it turns into a plane, but this is their main people mover, and it has had a real impact operationally to the point that the Marine Corps has actually, um, in, back in mid-January, out of operational necessity, they started putting some of them back in the air in Djibouti, implementing these new safety procedures, and they have said that since then, it's been about six weeks now that they've been flying there, with these new procedures, they've not seen any safety concerns 
concerns, but the Marine Corps would argue this is an aircraft that they need on a day-to-day -day basis, Tom. Courtney, I can throw any question at you and you know the answer. Uh, thank you very much. Courtney Kuby <laughs> covers it all from the Pentagon and she's outstanding. Coming up from us, the surprise move from the FDA, why the agency is delaying, delaying approval of a new Alzheimer's drug. Plus a big change for students taking the SAT this weekend. Yeah, you'll want to stay tuned for that. Stand by. We're back, and one of the world's biggest companies says it just cannot seem to get Russians, Russian spies, out of its computer systems. We're talking about Microsoft. In a blog posted in the last few hours, the company says Russian hackers, apparently known as Midnight Blizzard, have gained access to digital secrets, including source codes, basically the scripts for Microsoft's programs, as well as internal emails. The hacking group allegedly has ties to Russia's version of the National Security Agency. It's thought to be behind some of the biggest hacks in U.S. history. NBC's Kevin Collier is on the story. So one would think Microsoft has pretty robust security protocols in place. Why is it struggling to kick Russia, Russians, out of its system? We're not the only one asking that. A lot of critics are, are pointing to the fact that this is a company that uh, it's one of the most sophisticated tech companies in the world that uh, you would maybe want better. But at the same time, you know, this is one of those things where this is Russia's A team, the, the group that's being accused here. It's, it's like you said, the equivalent of, uh, of the U.S. NSA. And in cyber terms, they often refer to nation state hacking groups as as APT, Advanced Persistent Threats. And these guys are really persistent. They have been absolutely dogged at it, per Microsoft's description, since November, just constantly trying to get in. And, and why are the hackers specifically targeting Microsoft? Do we know that? Well, you know, I spoke with uh, Adam Myers, the vice president at CrowdStrike, um, and he pointed out, look, Microsoft has enormous government contracts. They do a bunch of AI work, but they also have government contracts with the U.S. government, all kinds of NATO governments, governments around the world. And if you want to look at Russia as a potential election interferer, you know, that's a lot of intelligence. All right, Kevin, thank you very much. A lot going on there with uh, Mr. Softy, as we used to say, covering it on Wall Street, Microsoft. Thanks very much, Kevin. All right, let's get you over now to the five things that our team thinks you might want to know about on this Friday night. Number one, Wisconsin's Governor Tony Evers releasing in the last hour or so, a half hour, news that nine people died in a crash on a highway there today. Police say it happened when a semi-tractor and trailer hit a van at an intersection. Police are investigating and they say that they will provide more information as it becomes available. Number two, the former president of Honduras, Juan Orlando Hernandez, was convicted in New York of conspiring with drug traffickers to get cocaine into the United States. You may remember he was arrested pretty much right after he left office in 2020 and then extradited to the United States. Prosecutors say he took millions of dollars in bribes. He denies the allegations. Number three, today, OpenAI announced CEO Sam Altman will rejoin the board of directors months after he was briefly ousted, kicking off that dramatic saga, you may recall. People resigned, employees were upset, Microsoft got involved over it all, and OpenAI says the investigation into what happened before Altman's removal is now complete. Number four, Eli Lilly says the FDA is pushing back the deadline to approve its experimental Alzheimer's treatment. The FDA was supposed to decide by the end of the month, but instead it's going to have outside advisors take a look at the data to learn more about how safe and effective the drug may be. And number five, this weekend, the SAT, attention students and parents, the SAT going digital. Kids will take the test on computers and tablets and it will be an hour shorter. They still have to do it at a monitored site or in school and can only have the test on their screens, nothing else. A new Pentagon report out today says there is no credible evidence that the U.S. government covered up the existence of UFOs or other alien life. It's a 63-page report, and it says a lot of people who thought they saw something, maybe E.T. flying through the sky, it was probably just a mix-up. The report says, quote, most sightings were the result of misidentification of ordinary objects and aerial phenomena. In addition to nixing the idea of a cover-up, 
The report shoots down a lot of the allegations made by so-called believers, including that there's ever been a verified sighting of an alien UFO. NBC's Gotti Schwartz joins me now. Gotti, you're from New Mexico. There are aliens buried there, I think. Oh, you've got the report. Okay, good. <laughs> so listen. I've got the, the report. Tom, this and is the, the best Pentagon, reading of, the, the, of any Friday. Okay, good. Well, the Pentagon is basically saying that despite all the decades of reports, you know, coming from the Air Force, coming from ordinary citizens, it's a bunch of nothing? Kind of. They're basically saying that the most wild allegations that we've heard so far are a bunch of nothing, specifically those claims that the U.S. government is in possession of alien bodies and crashed UFOs, and there was some big cover-up about it. As a New Mexican, I'm very sad about that. <laughs> uh, but they do say that they interviewed 30 people who were named as knowing about these alleged secret programs or might have seen something firsthand or had access to that information. They had some names. None of it turned up any actual proof and said they say a lot of this stuff came from a very small circle of people within the government. They were kind of repeating rumors to each other and then things got mixed up because of a lot of secrecy, a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, one perfect example, and I think you'll like this one, uh, they talked to someone who had allegedly touched an alien craft, or at least they were told, this person with this name, you go talk to him, he's touched a craft. Well, Arrow says they tracked that person down he said he didn't remember saying that, but he had touched a super secret stealth bomber back in the day. So that might have been the explanation there. As for all this recent stuff we've been seeing, we were hoping for some specifics. I have gone through this twice now. Uh, it is a fascinating read. But this report attributes them to a long list of generalities, like experimental aircraft, high-altitude balloons, there's satellites, rockets, flares, optical illusions, uh, drones, uh, planes, birds, stars, you name it. No mention yeah. of swamp gas in here, but pretty much everything else. Tom? You know, there's, there is an irony here, right? I mean, the government itself is saying that there was no government cover-up. Cover up. And, and, you know, critics are going to say, well, yeah, that's exactly what they would say. Um, but I've often wondered, you know, did anybody spot a UFO in the, in the 19th century? Or is this a 20th, 21st century phenomenon? In other words, did we only start thinking about UFOs when we became really aware of Mars and other planets and started thinking about life beyond Earth? If you talk to the people that are close to this, they say that pre-1947, 1947 was the, the, and it's in this report, was the first report of a flying sw uh, saucer from a pilot. Pre-1947, pre-nuclear age, uh, they were angels. People would see stuff in the sky, but they would attribute it to angels or celestial bodies or like all kinds of weird other stuff. And then after 1947, anything that was unidentified in the air became flying saucers. So who knows? I do know that the DOD is developing this Pelican case full of sensors that they are going to deploy anytime there's uh, a report of UFOs or a hotspot of UFOs. They're calling these kits gremlin kits, and they're filled with sensors to collect hard data. Data, so maybe we'll get some some proof sometime soon. You never know, Tom. Yeah, I know. But being a New Mexican, <laughs> I've been to that that where is that spot in the desert where they have these green Roswell. Well, I've been to Roswell. They've got, um, uh, Roswell, Trinity. There's all kinds of. Right. I mean, the, the Roswell is just for beginners. New Mexico has a long history of all this, and a lot of it goes back to the, the Manhattan Project. Ah, there you go. And Al, oh, you're tying into the uh, to the award ceremony. I see what you're doing there. Okay, thank you. We got Oppenheim, right? Sure. We got Oppenheim. All right, Gotti, there thank you, you go. very much. All right, be sure to catch Gotti on his show. Stay tuned now, later tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And isn't he a fine-looking guy? 8 p.m. Eastern Time on News Now. Back now, and a new jobs report out today shows that more jobs were added in February than expected, with 275,000 new jobs showing signs of a pretty strong jobs market. However, the good news growth is the good news job growth is colliding with some potentially worrisome news as well, because a report found that layoffs in February they hit the highest level for that month since the financial crisis back in 2009. And numbers like that are concerning for anybody looking for a job, of course. However, Gen Z and younger millennials, they have found a little hack, if you will, to give them some job security. They hope. NBC's Julie Serkin has the story. If you're on social media, chances are you've seen these videos all over your For You page. I'm pretty sure I'm getting laid off today. Job cuts, no matter the industry, can be found all over the headlines. So 
to avoid being just another one of the more than 160,000 layoffs this year alone, Gen Z and millennials found a little hack, calling it quits on the private sector and going public. Many looking to lock down government jobs for security. Public service was something I always wanted to do besides the benefits, but also one of the reasons is because you were not going to get laid off versus private sector. 77% of the class of 2024 say they're more likely to apply to a job that promises stability. And that's what a government job offers. We have to have a government. If we don't, our society is in trouble and our democracy as well. So it's not that your jobs are forever necessarily but certainly the organization is there. Salaried workers in the public sector hold their jobs for three more years on average than in private. And the younger generation is beginning to notice. Hashtag government jobs on TikTok has more than 23 million views. We need to start applying to jobs with the federal government. On a popular career site for college kids, federal jobs receive twice as many applications. The paycheck is probably smaller. On average, federal workers earned about 22% less than private sector workers with similar roles. But for many, the benefits are the selling point. Good health insurance, retiring early with a pension. Plus, after a decade, student loans are wiped clean for many. That's a perk nearly 70% say will influence their decisions. And of course, there's the work-life balance. You do your job nine to five and then you can enjoy your life after work and do what you want to do. But right now, less than 8% of federal workers are younger than 30 and nearly half are over 50. The challenge, though, is that the leaders in government don't often prioritize creating the opportunities for young people, ensuring that, that the managers know how to manage uh, Gen Z and millennials. And, and making sure the process itself is not overly onerous. Tamayo says the long process can be a big turnoff. I tell them that it's going to take a minute, and when they say, what do you mean a minute? I'm like five to six months. They get very discouraged by it. But for him, it's worth it. You just have to be patient because at the end of the day, you're going to get a secure job where you're not going to get laid off. All right, let's bring in Julie Serkin, who has more on this. You know, government jobs, kind of a hot-button issue, right, up there on the Hill. How does politics play into all of this? Of course it does, Tom. It definitely is a hot button issue. And right now, under President Biden, certainly working for the government might sound like a good idea. This jobs report you were talking about that came out today, 52,000 of those jobs were government jobs. That's about consistent with the monthly average we've seen over the last year. But here's the thing. Former President Donald Trump, who is likely going to be the Republican nominee for president facing off against Biden, he's promising to slash government jobs, slash government spending. That's something you see Republicans up here hammering Democrats about constantly. Right now, actually, the Senate is passing the government funding bills. Uh, this is an area in which Republicans are constantly saying, let's spend less, therefore potentially shrinking the amount of jobs in the government workforce in that space. And so certainly you could see a change happen when it comes to the November election. But so far, you heard Brandon Tamayo say this is an industry that he is looking to join in terms of the public sector. You saw those videos on TikTok. Certainly young kids especially, they're looking for that stability and security that public sector jobs can offer. By the way, there's some irony here, right? Uh, the, the kids are, uh, the young people are on TikTok because they want a government job, and yet the government is trying to shut down TikTok. Has anybody That's caught true. that cycle? <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's Julie. a good point, Tom. Thank you very much, Julie Serkin. All right, are you watching? In the last couple of minutes, the biggest star in college basketball began hitting the court on the biggest stage again. Caitlin Clark taking off her elusive title, Chase Tonight, starting in Minneapolis as her Iowa Hawkeyes take on Penn State at the Big Ten Women's Basketball Tournament. For the record, we checked the ticket website. The men's tournament still has thousands of unsold tickets. But for the women, sold out. Girl power for the first time ever. And the Big Ten expects this year's crowd to more than double last year's record attendance. Look at that. Pretty much all of it, thanks to Clark. Now the sport's all-time leading scorer, male or female, surpassing Pistol Pete just this week. NBC's Shaquille Brewster following all of this from Chicago for us. Uh, Shaq Clark is driving this insane burst of popularity in the women's game, right? And the TV numbers here are rivaling the NBA? 
Yeah, we have some firm numbers to match what really most of us knew already if you follow this at all, if you've been paying attention to it. That game that you were just referencing where you saw Caitlin Clark beat the uh, record for scoring, well, it rivaled those NBA games, some of the biggest games of the year. And look at the company that it's in. You see those other games happen during the holidays. It was the first ever NBA in-season tournament final. And then you have that competitive game with Caitlin Clark. And Tom, look, it's not just on TV where you see a lot of this excitement. I've been following some of the local coverage of the Big Ten tournament happening right now in Minneapolis. You had people lining up around that stadium, around that arena from 5.30 a.m. this morning, and the game just started in the past couple of minutes. People are pumped up. And look, this is not even the championship of the conference. It's a, a conference semifinal, so people are pumped up, and Caitlin Clark has a lot to do with it, Tom. You know, I always love college basketball or college football because, you know, it's a little raw. There's passion. There's energy. Um, talk to me about, though, whether her success, because it takes a team effort, uh, can they, can yeah. Iowa actually, can they get there to the championship? Uh, can her success alone lift them to the championship? It's possible. A lot of people are rooting for that, but she had a really great year last year as well, and they came up short against LSU. But let's look to what uh, people are betting on. I think that's always a good, a good sense. Our friends at FanDuel, they uh, are looking at the um, NCAA uh, women's basketball tournament. Look at the bets there. You see the South Carolina Gamecocks are the favorites, but LSU right behind them. And then you have Iowa there. Uh, some interesting nugget there. It was Iowa uh, who beat the South Carolina Gamecocks just by about four points uh, last year. And then the quarterfinals. So anything can happen. A lot of people are rooting for it. And Tom, I'm looking at the score right now. Right now, Iowa's playing and they're up 8-0. Okay, we're watching. Shaq, thanks, buddy. Have a great weekend. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories each day. We can't get all of them on the air. It's tough to read, to watch, to listen to everything. So our teams around the world have broken down a few. Here's a look at what they're watching. We call it the global. From Nigeria, breaking news here. Gunmen attacking a school, kidnapping more than 200 students. Abductions like this have become common in the northern part of Nigeria in the last de decade or so. The state governor promises to get the students back. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack. Parents are blaming the attack on a lack of security in the area. From France, the country officially inscribing the right to abortion in its constitution on International Women's Day. The government held a special public ceremony today to seal the amendment. It comes as France's president, Emmanuel Macron, says he wants it to be a right at the European Union level. And from Australia, look at this video, a bunch, I mean, a bunch of kangaroos just mobbing a golf course near Melbourne. Hundreds of them interrupting a game, and we don't really know where they came from or where they're going. A golfer behind the camera says, they better not stand on my golf ball. Look at that. They just keep coming and coming. Back now with tonight's original, with in-depth reporting on topics we keep an eye on around here. And tonight, it's the humanitarian crisis in Gaza growing worse by the hour. That temporary port in Gaza that President Biden announced last night, we're just learning it could take up to 60 days to be fully operational. That, according to two senior U.S. officials. The U.S. is hoping that the floating dock can help with food and, su and supplies arriving from the Mediterranean directly into Gaza. In the meantime, the situation for civilians growing more dire by the day, by the hour, especially for children, many now younger than the war itself. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald has more. The agony and devastation that's gripping Gaza is deepening. But it's the most vulnerable who are paying the heaviest price. The innocence of children stripped away as thousands become casualties of this war. Those who have survived so far are left with immeasurable trauma. Safety Children has been around for over 100 years. We work in all the big crises in the world. This is by far the worst situation, especially for children. A situation so dire, starving children are now forced to eat animal feed, ground up into patties. Cages for animals turned into beds for children. 
trapped in the middle of unspeakable horrors as the UN frantically warns Gaza is on the brink of famine. The Gaza Health Ministry says at least 20 people have died, over a dozen of them children, in just over a week from starvation and dehydration. For those kids lucky enough to escape, like Emily Abu Hamid and her five kids, life goes on. We first met the family in Cairo just hours after they escaped Gaza when Americans were allowed to leave. How has life been since you've come back to the United Kingdom? Surreal. Uh, a, a bit difficult to just adjust to normal life. We're just struggling to, to get back to some type of normal, I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, all the family we left behind, which is just constantly on our mind. Survivor's guilt haunts her entire family, especially her 10-year-old twin boys. I think you had mentioned that you didn't want to go to the park. Why not? Because I feel bad for my family in Gaza, because if they try to go outside, they could be, like, hurt and stuff and feel bad. Their older cousin, Ibrahim, was their best friend. The family says he died in an Israeli drone strike the day after Christmas while walking on a street in Gaza. It was his 13th birthday. It rips your heart out because they should be kids and they should play. UNICEF says more than a million children in Gaza need mental health support, but with almost no access to specialist doctors, these makeshift trauma tents meant to be a safe space for kids to just be kids for even just a moment. The UN says the chronic exposure to violence may be sowing the seeds of aggression saying the parents of these kids say that they're scared because they see what it is like for them, that there are fewer alternatives to armed resistance, and it's difficult to keep the kids away from that path because so many hopes have been destroyed. Trauma psychologists have termed it a continuous traumatic stress disorder. That is going to fuel in the hearts of these kids that I want to revenge maybe for my parents. I'm writing about something that hasn't been discussed or spoken about, the suicide that Palestinian kids were committing before the war 2023. Why? Is because of they've been stripped out of everything good in life. But for Emily's oldest daughter, Nora, for her, healing is living her life for the thousands of children who will never get the chance. I do my best and I work my hardest for them because I was able to leave. I'm, I'm not going to waste the opportunity that I have, my education, and I'm going to study and work hard for them. Right now, UNICEF says there are at least 17,000 kids in Gaza who have lost either one or both of their parents or have been separated from them. So these kids are now orphans. And the concern here is that number will only grow as this war rages on. Back to you. Okay, Megan, thank you very much. Megan Fitzgerald, and we'll be right back. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.